So welcome to a deep dive into JUnit 5. Nice to see all of you here tonight. My name is Sam Brannan. I'm a uh, Spring and Java consultant at a company called SwiftMine in, in Zurich. And I've been a Java developer for, for quite some time now. Um, I've also been a core committer for the Spring framework since 2007 um, for Spring 2.5 when I took over the testing support, re rewrote everything with um, integration support for uh, JUnit 4, uh, JUnit 3, and, and test in G. So that's kind of how I got into the, the testing stuff. Um, I'm also a trainer and a conference speaker, as you can uh, see from, from where I'm standing now. And uh, the most important reason I'm here tonight is uh, since last October, I've also been um, a core committer for JUnit 5. So just a quick note about my company, um, experts in Spring Enterprise Java, focusing on the Spring portfolio, obviously JUnit now since I'm a core committer as well. Um, Java EE, software architecture, code reviews, so if you need any assistance with stuff like that, you can contact us. Uh, we're in Zurich, but we can uh, travel. Um, we're also on Twitter, and uh, of course we have a, a website as well. So the agenda, um, first we're going to start, start talking about uh, impetus for change, right? So why do we even have JUnit 5? Um, we're going to look at JUnit 5 in, in great detail, or at least as much as we can within the course of, of this talk. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to cover some of the features with uh, Spring 5 and its support for JUnit 5, so you can see how other frameworks can, can build off some of the new features in JUnit 5. And then at the end, um, hopefully I have a few minutes left over for some, some Q&A, and if not, you can uh, approach me afterwards. So uh, first up, I'd like to see a show of hands. Who here uh, writes tests? Okay, and everyone else should be ashamed, right? Okay. Who writes uh, what they would call unit tests? Pretty much everybody. Who writes what you might consider integration tests? Okay. Uh, system tests? Fewer and fewer hands. All right, so going down. Um, who uses uh, that framework called JUnit? Anyone? Yeah? Anyone not using JUnit? This here. Don't really see any hands. Anyone use uh, test in G? Okay, not too many. Anyone use um, Spock? Something like that. Big groovy. Okay, a few more hands. All right, so good to know. So basically, uh, pretty much everyone uses uh, JUnit, right? So um, I didn't clarify that. Who's using JUnit 3? Anybody? Sorry, two hands, okay. Don't. Well, maybe you should be ashamed. Anyway, uh, everyone else is hopefully on JUnit 4 something. Uh, who's on, on JUnit 4.12? Okay, so maybe 10%, maybe all right. So that's the, the latest official release of JUnit. So yeah, the question. Why do we want a new version of JUnit, or, or do we need a new version of JUnit? Um, so the impetus for change is that JUnit 4 was uh, released uh, quite a long time ago, actually over a decade ago now. So there's the 4.0 release, right? Um, and a lot has changed since then in, in many ways. Um, first up, testing needs have, have matured. So what we do in terms of testing has, um, has changed. We're not just writing unit tests anymore. And one thing that I often tell people is that um, don't take offense, but JUnit is, is a horrible name. Why would I say that? Because uh, uh, pretty much everybody raised their hands when I asked who's writing integration tests, right? And sometimes you see people saying, well, I'm writing a, a JUnit test. And what, what does that mean, a JUnit test? Uh, you're testing, maybe you're unit testing, maybe you're integration testing, maybe you're writing some kind of functional test, acceptance test, stuff like that. Um, but so our, our needs have, have matured, right? We're not just testing one single piece of code. We're oftentimes testing with uh, real databases or real um, SMTP servers or maybe mocked or in-memory databases and stuff like that, right? So our expectations have grown in terms of what we uh, expect and desire from, from a testing framework. We don't want um, a unit testing framework, uh, so to speak. At least um, that's not what I want and what I hear from a lot of the people in the community, right? So JUnit originally was focused on unit testing, and in order to um, make it work well with integration testing, um, third-party developers had to do a bit more than they probably should have had to do. For example, if you look at the code that I had to implement for a runner to get Spring integrated, or the, the rules I had to write to get Spring integrated with JUnit, that's more work than should be done. And if you go look, if you're interested, in the code base, um, if you look at the, the Spring extension I'll talk about later, it's like 10 times uh, less code. Um, to integrate Spring into JUnit 5 now. So in terms of um, modularity, hopefully people keep that in mind. Uh, the framework should as well. If we look at JUnit 4, it's um, basically a, a big ball of mud, right? So there's only the JUnit jar, and I'll point that out again a bit later on. So it's just one jar that contains everything, what you need to write your own tests, what IDEs need to, to run the tests, all this kind of stuff, and what extension writers also need to extend the framework. So what that led to is basically um, the test discovery and execution are, are tightly, tightly coupled, right? Not very modular, um, still just you know, this, one, this one jar, this one module, not easy to change stuff either. 
um, extensibility, there's a lot of room for improvement in uh, JNet 4. So there is, of course, support for that. We'll talk about that, but um, it can be improved, and um, that's what we hope we have done well in JNet 5. And last but not least, let's not forget uh, Java 8, right? So I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but um, JNet 4 is still building on Java 5, right? So that's been EOL'd uh, quite a long time ago, right? So not even able to make use of things like streams or uh, Lambda expressions and stuff like that. So in terms of uh, JNet, um, how many people know that there's a, this runner API in JNet? Okay, maybe, maybe half. Maybe you've seen it from like um, Mokito or, or from Spring or something like that. Right, so this uh, runner API is in fact very powerful. That's a good thing. Um, it can do anything, but uh, you can't combine runners. It's just not, not possible, right? So they're not composable. Um, so for example, if you wanted to, and many developers have wanted to over the years, use the parameterized runner to have parameterized tests with JNet4 and Spring support and its runner, it's just not possible because you can only say run with one thing. You can't say run with, with two things. So the next up, uh, next step in the uh, evolution of JNet4, um, it's kind of a, a joke here at the top, right? So you can read this three or four different ways. Um, everybody knows rules are meant to be broken, right? Or you could say JNet4 rules if you're really into JNet4, or you can read the whole sentence, JNet4 rules are meant to be broken, and I would say they actually are broken and have always been broken, unfortunately. So uh, JNet4.7 introduced what's known as a method rule, uh, which you can configure with at rule. And JNet4.9 came up with a test rule, uh, which you can configure um, with at rule for uh, method level invocations and at class rule for class level invocations. So these are great for um, simple use cases. Um, some developers even have written their own over the years, so not too many people have written a runner, but a lot more people have written a rule because it's, it's easier to write. And you can com combine them, right? You can have them kind of nested if you want. You can have like a chain of responsibility if you want. But um, one big drawback here is a single rule cannot be used for both method level and class level callbacks, which is something a lot of frameworks need, right? So if you look at the, the support I've written for Spring over the years, I had to kind of fake it or hack it to get it to work. Um, plus, with rules, there is literally zero support for um, what I call instance level callbacks. Um, so that's where you would want to do something like uh, inject dependencies, right, from like uh, Juice or Spring or Mokito or something like that. So again, that was another way that um, extension writers had to kind of hack JN to get that to work. Case in point, it's two classes I've written for Spring, Spring class rule and Spring ref rule. If you want to use some kind of custom runner like parameterized and then use Spring support, you can do that um, with Spring's uh, rule support for JNet, but you have to declare both Spring class rule and the Spring method rule. And I would say that's um, it's bad, it's error prone, just leaves a lot of boilerplate copy and pasting that we would um, like to avoid. And with JNet 5, we can, in fact, avoid that. So um, another show of hands, who had heard of JNet 5 before DevOps? Oh, not too many people. Okay, maybe 5%, 10%. Who had heard of the uh, JNet Lambda campaign? Fewer, that would be expected. Okay, so maybe 3%, right? Very few. All right, so then I'll tell you a bit about it. Um, what happened was um, there were some guys uh, working on JNet4, uh, Johannes Link and Mark Phillip, and, um, of course, other people in the community thinking, we really need to do something with JNet, right? But they looked at JNet4, and they're like, well, well, we can't really do much with it because it's still on, on Java 5. We don't want to break backwards compatibility. So many IDEs and everything, build tools are tied into some of the internals, which is pretty horrible, like working with uh, using reflection to access fields. So they started this campaign, um, called it Lambda, because they wanted to support stuff like Lambda expressions, Java 8, and things like that. And then this team was later joined by um, Matthias Merdes, Stefan Bechtold, and uh, myself. Sam Brandon. Uh, that was all last year, so we did the um, campaign online from July through October 2015, and we raised almost 54,000 euros um, from over 400 individuals and companies. It sounds like it's a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, it isn't as much as you would think due to um, fees and taxes and uh, travel costs and hotel costs and these kind of things, because uh, we had uh, meetings in person. But anyway, we did get quite a bit done for the, the prototype. In addition, uh, four companies donated six weeks of developer time, um, and I have Pivotal listed here as having donated the most data development, um, sorry, donated cash and developer time. So if your name is on this page or uh, a company you work for, thank you very much. It helped quite a bit to get us up and going. Um, we started off with a kickoff team last October with some, some big names in the community. So we had a developer from Gradle, IntelliJ, and Eclipse there, as well as these uh, other developers, core developers working on uh, JUnit 5 itself. So now actually diving into JUnit 5. 
Um, the roadmap, just kind of give you an idea of where we came from and where we're going. Uh, again, we started off this prototype immediately after that kickoff, right? And then we delivered that on December 2nd last year. So that's just a, a tag in the repo on GitHub. Then we did a lot of work, um, reworking stuff, deleting a bunch of stuff, um, taking feedback from the prototype and released that this February. So that's um, something some people have consumed and used. Um, more importantly, uh, five months later, it took us a while, right, since the uh, campaign funding ran out, people working in their, in their spare time. Um, but in July of this year, we released a milestone one with lots of changes to the internals, um, breaking it all up into kind of three different categories, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, M2 came out a few weeks later with some, some big uh, bug fixes, and we've been working on M3 since then. We planned on uh, releasing it on, on Halloween uh, a few weeks ago. That didn't quite happen, so we're working on that now. We're hoping to get um, something like uh, miles on 3 and 4 out maybe this, this fall, um, some release candidates early next year, and then um, getting, hopefully, final GA release uh, Q1 next year. So that's, that's the plan now. So, JUnit 5 in a nutshell, what is it? Um, we like to think it's modular. At least we have modules, right? So let you be the judge of that. Um, extensible, so that was definitely a main uh, focus here um, in contrast to, to JUnit 4. Um, we also like to think that it's modern in terms of how things are structured and also the things we support, like Lambda expressions and these kind of things. Another thing that is, it's uh, what we call um, simultaneously forward and backward compatible. Um, might sound a bit bizarre, but um, when we met as a team, we decided, well, Adoption is really important, right? So people are out there right now running uh, their JNIT 4 tests, right? Maybe Spock, something else, we're still running on the JNIT 4 infrastructure. And we know the IDEs aren't going to give us support and the build tools aren't going to give us support immediately, right? Because first, JNIT 5 has to be popular before they're going to support it. It's kind of like a chicken and egg problem. So we came up with a way to um, basically make sure that the platform, we'll talk about that, supports uh, JNIT 3, 4, and 5 all at the same time and uh, any uh, future versions. Um, so if there's a, a JUnit 6 out later, something like that. Um, and any of the new testing frameworks, so for example, JUnit Jupyter, we'll talk about that. That's a JUnit 5 program model. Um, you can run it on top of the JUnit 4 infrastructure. So that kind of solves this chicken and egg problem. And the way you do that is using uh, the at run with annotation from JUnit 4 and this uh, JUnit platform class we see here. So that actually launches the new stuff, all the new stuff, JUnit 5 on top of JUnit 4. Um, and I actually do that um, in Springs course brings build because we have testing support for our um, JUnit 5 support, but we're using JUnit 4 and all the build infrastructure there. So I just run the tests like that and it just kind of um, basically makes it look like it were a JUnit 4 test. It's kind of a, a workaround for the time being. So another thing, um, if you looked at JUnit 5 early on, uh, it was all one kind of big project, though modular. And for M1, what we did is um, we had a lot of internal discussions. What's the best way to go forward to actually modularize this? Um, and we came up with the notion of JUnit 5, it's not one thing. Um, it's actually a platform. It's JUnit Jupyter and it's JUnit Vintage. So in the past, JUnit 4 was, was, was all the stuff, right? It was the programming model, the extension model, the platform, the discovery. All this stuff was one thing. We figured we need to actually to split this up so these things can evolve um, at different rates over time. So first up, we have the JUnit platform. Um, and we're calling this version 1.0 since it's uh, never existed before. Complete rewrite, no, co no code taken at all from, from JUnit 4. Um, and this is the foundation for launching any kind of testing framework that runs on the JVM. So you can think of uh, JVM, right, for running stuff like Java, Kotlin, Groovy, right? Um, and now this JUnit platform is a platform running on top of the JVM that allows you to write other testing frameworks. Um, and then we also have the launcher and test engine APIs. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Beyond that, there's a console launcher. Um, we have support for Gradle and, and Maven. And then we have what we call JUnit Jupyter. So this is what you might want to think of as JUnit 5, uh, if you want to. Um, but we didn't want to run into the issues that we had in the past with like JUnit, right? So JUnit 4 includes JUnit 3 in the jars. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that is the case. Um, we figured we don't want to tie it to a number. Um, JUnit Jupyter is a new programming model. It's a new extension model. And um, maybe we end up releasing version 6 of that programming model or extension model. So right, we don't want to call it JUnit 5 itself in case you're confused about that. And which planet is the fifth planet from the sun? Anybody know? Jupiter, all right. And it also starts with JU, so kind of sounds nice. So JUnit Vintage, um, I voted 
first we're calling it legacy, but we didn't want to offend too many people, so um, <laughs> I thought retro might also work as well. Um, but we call it JUnit Vintage officially. So that's uh, given the same version number as the most recent release of JUnit for itself. And that is um, basically a test engine uh, that's responsible for running uh, JUnit 3 and JUnit 4 based tests. Right, so you can still run your old JUnit 3 tests even when you're um, starting with starting to use JUnit Jupyter. You can run your old JUnit 4 tests, your Spock tests, etc. No problems there. Well, we hope there are no problems. Um, you have to test and let us know. So this Launcher API, what is that? Um, that's used by IDEs and build tools to, uh, surprise, launch the framework, right? So basically get it all bootstrapped and up and running and actually execute the tests. So um, that's a central API for, um, first off, discovering uh, tests, like are they in classes, are they in maybe XML files or, or JSON uh, files or something like that, and then um, finding one or more engines to delegate to to actually execute those tests. For that, we have what's called um, a launcher discovery request. You wouldn't use that on your own, probably, unless you're doing something really low level. This is something more like um, what the IDEs and build tools are going to use. Um, but basically, it has um, a couple of different things you can configure. You configure what we call selectors and filters. So the selectors are the things that select what you want to run, like you select a class, or you select um, one method or a couple of different methods in different classes, or maybe you select a package for class path scanning as they run all the tests in this package. Um, and that's very Java-centric, right? So um, what we've done um, building up in this uh, M3 release that's coming out is we're adding support for selecting other types of things, like selecting a URI or selecting a directory in the file system or a file in the file system or maybe uh, some, some file in your, in your class path that's a class path resource. And this opens up um, the selection to other types of testing frameworks that might work with something like XML files, right? That's not, not just focused on, on Java classes and methods and stuff like that. And filters obviously allow you to filter stuff out, say like only classes whose um, names match this pattern or only things in this package, um, only things with these tags, stuff like that. So you will see some uh, reflection of, of these selectors and filters uh, when you're configuring your, your build, for example, um, with, with um, Gradle or, or Maven. Um, yeah, so that will come back into play there. In terms of um, feedback while things are running, um, in JUnit 4, you might have known the, the run listener. In uh, JUnit 5, in the platform, we have what's known as a test execution listener API. Um, if anyone's looked at Spring's testing support, uh, there's a class of the same name, but they have different purposes, so don't get confused there. So this is just a way to um, get receive events about what's happening to generate reports and stuff like that. And um, last but not least, there is um, a console launcher implementation that allows you to launch the platform on your own. Um, if you want to do some kind of scripting or whatever, there are some people that want to do that. Um, so we have command line support as well if you're not using uh, Gradle or Maven. So this test engine API, um, you can think about it it's somewhat analogous to um, what a runner was in, in JNIT4, um, but a slightly different focus. Um, so a test engine, what it does, it's responsible for discovering the tests that it is then later going to execute. And that's for a particular programming model. So the JNIT Jupyter one is not going to run any of the JNIT4 ones, right? And, and the other way around, similar. Okay. Now how does this, uh, these things get picked up? Um, that happens automatically or automatically, however you want to look at it, using the um, standard service loader mechanism from, from Java. So if you have um, a test engine in the class path and it's configured correctly for the service loader, you just have it there, then the JUnit platform is going to automatically just find that engine and automatically ask it to detect tests and then execute them. So it's kind of kind of magical. So maybe you get the, um, some support for, for Kotlin. Uh, they're having a framework they're going to work on there or specs or something else. You put that in the class path and it's just going to work with the platform. And, that, and that's one of the goals we have is that other people can also write their own testing frameworks and have it automatically supported on the JNIT5 infrastructure. So no surprise, for the uh, Jupyter uh, API and extensions, we have a Jupyter test engine, and we also have a vintage test engine. So again, this is the one that, that runs the JNIT4 and JNIT3 code or Spot code and stuff like that. Or you can implement your own. As I mentioned, people have, have already started doing. So that's, that's pretty cool, and we're happy to see that. Now for a bit of the, the big picture here, um, we see in the middle, we have the uh, JUnit platform, right? And above that, we have different uh, testing frameworks. So we have the, the old school stuff, vintage here, right? So JUnit 4, and JUnit 3, stuff like that. We have the new stuff with uh, Jupyter here, and then something else, third party. For example, um, there's a framework out there called Spexy uh, that already supports uh, its own kind of a spec 
uh, testing framework with um, Scala, Groovy, or, or Java. And it does that with um, the APIs for, for uh, JUnit 5. And on the other side, you have the IDEs and, and build tools that are interacting with the platform. So now if we look behind the scenes, what does that actually look like? We see for um, Vintage, we have JUnit 4, JUnit 412, right? So that's that one jar, that one uh, big fat jar that does everything with JUnit 4. Um, and just for comparison's sake, so all the new stuff, right? So JUnit, the platform, is this code in here, right? And the new um, programming model and extension model, that's all in here. So all this modular stuff was just this one big jar in JUnit 412. So that's what I'm talking about, how it's been modularized and, and split up so that these things can evolve separately. So for new tests, you can write new tests, and you're only programming against the JUnit Jupyter API. You actually don't even care about the test engine or anything else in the platform. You just care about basically the annotations. Or if you're writing extensions, you care about the extension uh, APIs. And that's what this other framework has done over here. So Spexy has its own API and its own engine. And these things implement stuff from the JNIT platform engine. Um, the launcher finds those, executes them. And then we have these build tools, right? So we have the Gradle support, uh, Surefire support for Maven. Um, we have this platform runner. That's that, that JUnit runner I talked about. Um, we also have this console launcher. And these things all interact with uh, the launcher API directly. So that's kind of the big picture in terms of modular modularity. So in terms of IDs and build tools, um, if you're using IntelliJ IDEA, um, you're in luck. They have um, first class support for uh, JUnit 5, more specifically uh, JUnit Jupyter, since um, version 2.16.2 .2 and, and higher. Um, I'll be demoing later on, hopefully, some, some uh, examples with uh, 2.16.3 early access program. Um, Eclipse. Surprise, uh, they joined the bandwagon uh, last week, right? So I just, I just downloaded and installed it. Um, if you download 4.7 M3 and uh, install some, some beta code, uh, you can see how their, their JNIT support, uh, JNIT 5 support works in Eclipse. And um, I think it's uh, quite nice, actually, in, in both IDs already at this point. NetBeans, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, Gradle, so we have our own interim solution uh, from the JNIT team that, that we've written. Um, it, it works, it, it's not the best, and we actually don't want to uh, support it forever, so we, we're really hoping that the, uh, the Gradle team will at some point take it over. And if you want to see how that works, uh, you can check out the user guide, or you can even look at our own builds, because we use our own Gradle plugin to run our own JNIT 5 test to run, uh, to test JNIT 5. So yeah, we're using JNIT 5 to test JNIT 5. Um, Maven, we also have support for that initially started by um, the JUnit team itself, and it's uh, in the process of being taken over by the Maven Surefire team. So we like to see that get um, taken over totally there so we can stop having to, having to deal with that and have someone better um, skilled at that. And again, for this as well, check out the user guide or some of the, the sample projects. So in terms of the, um, the extension model for JUnit Jupyter, Right, so this is not an extension model for uh, the platform itself. This is an extension model that's specific to when you're writing tests against the new JN and Jupyter uh, API. So first up, we have um, extension. That's just a, a marker interface. Um, and it, that's in the org JN and Jupyter API extension package. And then in there, you can see all the options uh, for the extensions you can, you can write on your own. One nice thing, right, so these things are composable, um, as I mentioned before, with uh, JUnit 4, right, you know, you could only have one runner. Um, a rule couldn't implement uh, the, the, the two types of rules, right, the method rule and the, and the test rule. Um, but with JUnit Jupyter, you can implement as many as you like. And if you'd like to see an example, the Spring extension implements almost all of the extensions, right? So these things are, are easily composable. And if you want to register one, um, you remember with JUnit 4, <clears throat> we had the runner, so it said at run with this runner. And with uh, Jane and Jupiter, we kind of took the same notion there, but we have extensions, so we say at extend with uh, one or more extensions. And you can declare that on, on interfaces, um, something you couldn't uh, do in Jane 4. You can declare it on, on classes and at the method level, um, and very likely at the, the field level coming up in, in Milestone 4 as well. And last but not least, this is also um, very important. Uh, to me and, and to a lot of developers, uh, you can use it as a meta annotation. So you can create a custom compose annotation. And for those who don't know what a meta annotation is, a meta annotation is an annotation declared on another annotation in the source code. So Spring has always kind of had the support, and you can find numerous uh, complaints and questions on Stack Overflow. Uh, why can't I use uh, JUnit's at run with blah, blah, blah as meta annotation with the Spring stuff? Um, it's because it didn't work. 
because Jane 4 didn't support it. But um, all of the annotations that we have um, that we use in, in JNet 5 or JNet Jupyter, um, those are supported as meta annotations. So you can declare them as meta annotations and JNet will find them. So in terms of these APIs, first up we have what are known as lifecycle callbacks. So these are analogous to um, the annotations that we'll, we'll see in a minute as well. Um, we have before all callback and those kind of, you know, they wrap around, right? So you have the before all callbacks and at the end you have your after all callbacks and at the next level um, going down to, to the test method level. So the first level is actually more of the, the container level or the test class level if you want to think about it like that. Then we have the before each and, and after each, and again, those, those wrap around the execution inside. And then the lowest level, we have before test execution and after test execution. So those happen, those get invoked right around the invocation of your test method. So if there were a little line here, this would be your actual test code executing there. But see, these are all the options that you have as extensions. So you see, even with the lifecycle callbacks, you have a lot of points you can tie into. The next topic is what's known as um, conditional uh, test execution. Uh, we have that at the, uh, the container level and at the test execution level. So the test is going to be like the test method, and again, the container um, typically is going to be uh, at the class level. Next up, we have what's known as a test instance post-processor. Um, if you're familiar with Spring, you might have heard of um, bean post-processors, um, so it's, it's not too different from that. Basically, this is this uh, instance level callback that I was saying never existed in JNet4, and in JNet5 and JNet Jupyter, we have explicit support for that. So the Mokito extension we've written and handing off to the um, uh, Mokito team uses this. The Spring extension uses this. If it was someone to write something like a, a, a Juice extension, it would also use this, right? So that's how you could do dependency injection at the right time. Um, parameter Resolver, we'll talk about that in more detail, but that's um, for dependency uh, injection as well. And test execution exception handler. So that's an exception handler uh, around the test execution. So it's actually going to be called um, right before that one there. So that allows you to um, log exceptions or, or maybe um, uh, swallow an exception, something like that. So that's it for the basics of the extension model. Now about the program model, what um, maybe more of you are more interested, right? What are you going to be using on, on, on your daily job? These things are found in the org Jane at Jupyter API package in the Jane and Jupyter um, API uh, module, right? So for your Maven coordinates. And in there, we have um, annotations and support for meta annotations, um, support for assertions and assumptions, uh, custom display names, uh, visibility. I'd like to mention that. So uh, Jane and 4, everything had to be public. And uh, Jane and Jupyter, we don't care. As long as it's not private, uh, we'll still find it. And we're going to invoke it via reflection anyway. So you don't have to put public on your classes and methods and stuff like that. Tagging is a, a new feature, at least um, first class within the platform itself, but also first class within the JNet Jupyter um, programming model. So JNet4 um, did have something similar with categories, but it was always um, kind of experimental. Uh, conditional test execution, I mentioned that before. Um, dependency injection, uh, not only for methods, but also for constructors, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, we also support lambda expressions and, and method references in, in various places, and interface default methods. So who's actually on uh, Java 8? All right, maybe 6%, that's good. So hopefully these uh, last two points aren't, aren't too confusing to too many people. Um, another feature um, that's popular, uh, someone in the community, people had written their own runners for JNet4, is the notion of um, nested test classes. And we'll look at that uh, more details later on. Um, last but not least, dynamic tests is, is something that's um, uh, pretty cool and, uh, and rather popular um, that uses Lambda expressions to uh, register tests dynamically. So in terms of these annotations, uh, we have an at test annotation. I know everyone's probably really shocked about that, right? Um, we couldn't come up with a better name, so we just stuck with test. But it is in a different package, right? So don't, don't get confused when you're uh, starting to use Jane Jupyter. Um, we also have an at test factory. So that's for these dynamic tests. And I have grayed out here on the right um, and testable. Uh, you wouldn't use that on your own, but if you're writing your own test engine, you would want to use that. And if you're interested in that, just check out um, the documentation for that. So some things we've done a little bit differently. Um, we came up with different names for the, the lifecycle annotations. So instead of having them um, at before and at after, we have um, or at before class and at after class, we have at before all and at after all. So that's for all of the tests within that container. And then at the next level, instead of at before and at after from uh, JNet4, we have um, before each and, and after each. And then uh, we have something totally new. So at display name, you can um, provide a custom display name. We have at tag to set these tags. Um, at disabled instead of at ignore. Um, because when we talk about conditional test execution, uh, there's a result from that. And it's the thing's either going to be enabled or, or disabled. 
so ignore didn't, didn't make any sense anymore. And then we have this at nested annotation for these nested test classes. So assertions, um, at first we thought maybe we don't even want to have assertions at all, as in we don't want to implement them, right? Because there's such you know, good libraries already out there. Um, but then we ended up implementing um, quite a few and uh, we keep adding some, but we, we promise not to, to go overboard. These are all in the um, assertions class. Um, limited set of core assertions. Of course, we have stuff like assert equals assert not null. Um, but we also have some, some cooler things that weren't in the JUnit 4 support. So we have assert throws for um, asserting an expected exception to be thrown by um, a code block, which is a lambda expression or a method reference. Um, we also have support for uh, timeouts. So instead of doing that as a rule or at the, um, the test annotation uh, level, we have assertions for that. And you can basically assert that a timeout is not exceeded for a given uh, block of code that you provide as a lambda expression. By default, the first one is just going to be um, lazy. It's just going to wait on it to finish. So if it hangs, then your, your code's going to hang. Um, in cases where you think that it might hang, you could switch to um, a preemptive timeout. And that's going to basically kick it off in a, in a different thread. But the reason you wouldn't want to do that always is, for example, if you're using something like Spring um, has a test um, transaction management that's um, bound to a thread local. So if you spin off a new thread, then your test transaction will not be visible to your test code, kind of defeating the purpose. That's why there's the, the two options there. Another really cool thing um, is assert all. You might have heard of uh, soft assertions from um, uh, assert j, right? Something like that. Um, so you can assert multiple things at the same time, providing them all as um, little executable lambda expressions, and then JUnit will uh, execute each of them and catch the exceptions for each of them, and then report all of the, the assertion errors at one time, right? So if you have some code where maybe, um, maybe your equals is limited only to something like a primary key or something like that, and it's not checking all the fields, but you want to check all the fields in, in some kind of domain entity, then you can assert all of them in one and have them, all the errors reported um, in one go. Another thing that we've done, um, we've used uh, or started making use of um, more functional programming, right? Things like that from, from Java 8. So instead of just providing um, a string for your, for your error message when your assertion fails, you can provide that as a supplier of string. So that can just be lazily um, evaluated. Why would you want to do that? Well, what if your um, string concatenation ends up being expensive or looking up stuff in some files um, for, for better um, debugging purposes? You don't want to build up that failure string if there's no failure. So that's why we allow this to be done lazily now. And the other thing uh, might catch off guard, um, unless you use test and G, the message is now the last parameter. So you're going to say stuff like assert equals A and B, and then give the reason at the end instead of putting the reason at the beginning in terms of the, the method parameter list. And of course, if you need more power, and there are many times you will, um, we recommend that you do use other frameworks, right? So use something like assert J or Hamcrest, you know, something more powerful with matchers, other stuff like that. So. Now I will see if the uh, demo gods are on my side. I am showing you, this is the, uh, the beta work, again, just released last week. So for Eclipse 47 Milestone 3, and I should be able to create a class. I'm going to call it DevOps Tests. Again, doesn't have to be public if you don't want it to. You can create a test. Do not pick the org JNIT1. That's JNIT4. I mean, you can if you want to use JNIT4, but JNIT5, JNIT Jupyter, make sure you pick the right annotation there. And void also doesn't have to be public, right? So you can just say first test. And I'm not going to do anything exciting here. I'm just going to run the class, right? So we see that it ran the class. It just looks like a normal JNIT4 test. So this is all quite good. Um, Pull in a second test. Well, this shouldn't be a surprise either, right? It's just going to show both. I just wanted to show that uh, they actually already have support in here for executing individual tests with, with JNIT5, JNIT Jupyter. So that's also good support there. So in terms of these um, assertions, right, um, it shouldn't be a surprise there. Just make sure you pull them from the right assertions class. So we see here at the top that's coming from the Jupyter assertions class. Run that. No surprises there. Right, but what about something like uh, an, an exception, right? So, uh, what is going to be? Well, this is not the uh, most recent version. There's an expect throws. 
right? Expected type, and we could just say something like exception class. And this is what I was talking about where you can uh, just provide some code, right? So you can say, I have this uh, block, right? Some kind of Lambda expression. And if I run this as is, it's going to fail because it's going to say expected an exception to be thrown, but nothing was thrown, right? So now if I have a new exception, right? So, yep. If I run that now, now the test passes, right? So that's nice, right? Now what if I want to actually get to the exception? I can assign that to um, a new local variable, and I can just say exception, and then I can say something like assert true um, exception message equals foo, right? We hope that this runs. Right? So that works. So you can get hold of that exception. Um, and in that, such situations, you might actually want to use something more powerful like, like assert j, for example. But this is quite nice in uh, Jane Jupyter. Another thing, what about timeouts, right? So I mentioned there's these timeouts. So you can say assert timeout um, needs a duration. And I have, um, let's say, something like milliseconds, I don't know, 50, right? And again, we need some kind of code to run here. So if I run this, hopefully that code takes zero time, so it's not going to cause it to fail, right? Didn't exceed the timeout. But what if I tell it to sleep for a bit, and I tell it to sleep for 55 milliseconds? Then, what is this saying here? Yes. Better? All right. So that failed, right? So exception exceeded timeout of 50 milliseconds by 9 milliseconds. Okay, it's not exact science there. We don't know where the other four milliseconds came from, but the point is um, it, it took longer than we'd expected. And again, the other option would be to have um, a cert timeout uh, preemptively if you'd wanted to do that. And again, that would run it actually in a separate thread. That would execute this code block in a separate thread. But so what if you don't want this to be, um, you know, just a, a lambda expression like that, right? You can just have a standard Java 8 syntax like that. Or maybe you have some, some method you're invoking in your service layer. Maybe it's a, I seriously doubt it's called take nap, but maybe it is called take nap, right? So uh, you could have that something you're invoking in your service layer, actually testing your code. You want to make sure that it, that it runs fast enough. So those are kind of the, the basics there. Next up, um, assert, uh, assumptions, right? Moving on. Who's actually heard of uh, assumptions in, in JUnit 4? Okay, that's more than I expected, so 10%. So assumption is something that you assume to be true, and if it's not true, then you want to just abort uh, the test immediately. And that's been in, in JN4 for, for quite some time. Um, and this is in, in the assumptions class in JN Jupyter. Uh, again, similar to with the assertions, we didn't uh, want to go overboard, so we have a very limited set of, of core assumptions that you can use. And uh, for those, we have for things like assume true or assume false, where you, you, know, you pass it in some kind of condition. Um, we also have support for um, Boolean suppliers and uh, suppliers of strings, so if you want to use uh, method references and stuff like that as well. Um, in addition, we have something a bit more advanced, so you can say, assuming that this condition holds true, then execute this, uh, this block of code that you can provide as a Lambda expression. So why would you want to do that? Um, we do something similar uh, in, in maybe only one place in the Spring uh, Core Testing Framework, but we have one thing where um, if it's on the CI server, then we want to run an additional uh, bit of code as well, and then otherwise run the rest of the code always. So that's why you would want to use something like that. Now in terms of assumptions, um, this is programmatic, this is inline. If you want to reuse it, of course you could create some kind of utility method, but then you might copy and paste that across your code base, right? So we'll see later on um, with uh, <clears throat> conditional test execution, custom annotations, meta annotations, stuff like that, you can actually um, provide a different kind of more flexible, reusable mechanism for this um, based on uh, conditional test execution instead of programmatically. It ends up being code in the end, but in terms of the API or the, the user experience, it looks like you just, you know, just add an annotation there. So, quick example with that. So, you could say, assume true and put false, right? And then if I, just because I'm too lazy to type, 
So normally if this code were to execute, uh, except that it's going to complain, yes, right? All right. If the assumption were not true, right, this would... Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Right, so that passed, right? That means this code never got executed, right? You could have something more, you know, assume that uh, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Who thinks that's true? Wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, okay, sorry. I, I didn't rehearse that one, obviously. <laughs> so, so now the, the code gets executed, right? So now we could uh, uncomment the rest of this. But that's, that's one way you can have these assumptions baked in, or you could do the assuming that, stuff like that. All right. So test names. Who has ever wanted to have a test name other than just the, the method, method name? Yeah. So if you use something like Spock, right, so with Groovy, um, that, that's, that's already possible. Um, but with, with JNet4, um, typically not, right? So um, by default, the names are going to default to the, the test class or the test method names. And the same is also true in uh, JNet Jupyter. Um, so the character is going to be limited based on, on the, the Java syntax, right? So in uh, JNet Jupyter, the answer to that is a at display name. And you can use that to provide custom display names. So just for the users, not, not technical names. And these things can contain spaces, uh, special characters, and even emoji, right? I know this is, usually gets the best claps. We'll see if it happens here. <laughs> um, dependency injection. So things like mocks, right? Injecting mocks or injecting beans from uh, Spring Application Context, that kind of stuff. Um, this is one place where we like to say the extension model meets the program model, right? So come, come from both sides there. Somebody writes the extension, and, and you get to use it. Um, and for that, we have this parameter resolver extension API. So each parameter resolver um, is asked, do you support this thing? Um, and if yes, then please resolve the parameter. Uh, the parameter is the, is the new one, right? The new uh, reflection API from, from Java 8. So that's a parameter either from a constructor or from a method. And yep. So um, this is applicable not just for, for at test methods, um, but for other kinds of methods as well, like your test factory methods, uh, constructors, your um, at before each methods, stuff like that. You can register multiple of these simultaneously, um, but only one of them wins. If two of them say they support it, uh, it ends up being an exception because Jenny wouldn't know which one to ask to actually resolve the parameter. Um, so typical use cases, as I mentioned, um, you might want to inject like uh, a mock, or you might want to inject some kind of server uh, URL where you've set up a URL in your extension and you want to make it available. Um, or a port number, something like that. Maybe a data source for an embedded database. Maybe the application context from Spring. And we'll see that in an example uh, later on. So um, a lot of times people wanted to find out the, the test name or some test information. And in um, JNet4, that's possible with uh, test name. It was also possible back in, in JNet3 uh, in certain scenarios. Um, but in JNet Jupyter, we have test info. Is you can inject this into your constructor, at test, at before each methods, et cetera. And that gives you access to stuff like the display name, um, maybe the technical one, or maybe the, the custom display name. Um, it gives access to the tags, uh, the class that's currently executing, uh, the test method that's currently executed, et cetera. And for that, we have a, an implementation of this parameter resolver called test info parameter resolver. And that's registered for you automatically by default, so you don't have to do that on your own. Again, eating our own dog food. Um, why do I say that? Another goal we have with JNet Jupyter and JNet5 is that we didn't want to implement things and say, well, we're not going to let anyone else uh, benefit from this, this functionality. So whenever we came up with an extension point, uh, so far we've made it a public extension point that anyone else can implement, and we also implement it ourselves. So here we're, we're doing that. Um, see also, um, test reporter, that allows you to um, print or report additional information based on some um, code executing in your test method. Um, the Mokito extension, again, uh, we've written that, um, and we're handing it off to the Mokito team. And the Expr Spring extension um, does this, this stuff as well, this parameter resolution for dependency injection. So display names and dependency injection. Quick demo here. So this thing was just called first test, right? And what if I wanted to change that to something else? Maybe not so exciting. 
it's going to fail anyway. But the point is, it has a custom name. I don't know. Can everyone see that? Very small print. This is my 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 first test. So that's there. Um, you can do that. You can use other special characters, spaces, stuff like that. And for the next one, I don't know how to personally. Um, let's see. Type emoji in Eclipse, but I know this trick. <laughs> so let's see what people think about this. I have now copied an emoji. I'm going back, and now I know what's going to happen. Who thinks they will show up? <gasps> All right. So yes, you can use emoji. Very exciting. It doesn't work yet in the uh, in IntelliJ. Sorry. It just shows uh, like blank spaces, but maybe they'll get around to supporting the emoji as well. I mean, you can type the emoji in; it just it doesn't actually display them in, in the, the tree. Um, but our, our Gradle support and uh, our build support, they also um, print this and uh, generated XML. So even on your CI server, you can see the emoji. I can't think of too many useful things other than maybe something like if you're doing locales, right, and you have different flags for different countries re representing locales, that might work. Or you could say like this. Uh, method is a pile of something and use a particular emoji for that, but um, I'm not going to demonstrate that. Okay. Ah, dependency injection. I did not show that. So, I said there's this test info thing, right? If I can type test info, test info, and I'm not going to do anything exciting with it other than print it out. So, what? Aha, uh -huh, that looks much better. Yes, so this is the test info, the display name. This is the, uh, the custom display name, right, that we saw there. There aren't any tags. Um, I could add a tag if I wanted. The, the class, uh, I fixed this. This was a bug. It no longer uses the optional. It actually shows you the real class name. Um, also giving you the test method that's there and uh, the method signature. So, yeah, if we had tags, um, somebody maybe you want to, to do that, we're going to... If I run that again, I assume it will show that the tags are there. Yeah, so it puts a list of the, of the tags in there as well. And again, uh, with the Makito extension, you can use at mock here, for example, as I have the mock injected. And with um, Spring, you can inject stuff uh, like from, from the application context or the application context itself. So um, tagging, well, kind of got ahead of myself there. Um, basically, just declare at tag on a test uh, interface, class, or method. Um, for example, at tag fast test, we just um, saw those in uh, working. Um, I didn't show you how to configure the tags. You can do that from the, the Gradle configuration or the Maven configuration, um, and hopefully uh, in the near future also within Eclipse um, and, and IntelliJ um, to set that up. So custom tags. What if you don't want to uh, copy and paste this at tag fast everywhere? Hopefully you don't want to. So a custom tag is pretty easy to do. You just uh, declare a tag as a meta annotation on your own custom annotation. So here we have um, public at interface fast, meta annotated with at tag fast. And then we can just use that on our test method or on our um, test class if we had uh, included the, the type element type there at the top. So here we have now at fast and at test. And you could have maybe at fast, um, at smoke, at integration, at CI server, these kinds of things. But you can also go one step beyond that, and this is even more, more powerful. I think a lot of people are going to like this. So you can compose tags, right? Or you can compose your annotations. Um, declaring tag, again, is a meta annotation, but in addition, um, alongside other annotations, maybe from JUnit, maybe from Spring. It uh, works out quite nicely. You just have to make sure the frameworks you're using also know how to find annotations as meta annotations. And Spring does that, and JUnit Jupyter does that, so it's a nice mix here. Um, here we see at tag fast and at test. And now we're saying this thing is fast test. So we can type even less across our code base using at fast test like this. And I'll show you later on with Spring you can do uh, even more. So the next topic is this conditional test execution. Again, I said it's something kind of like uh, the assumptions, right? But it's a, more of a reusable approach, more of an annotation-based approach. <clears throat> Again, this is another place where the extension model meets the programming model, right? So somebody writes an extension, maybe someone in your team, and you get to use it um, as you write your tests. The two levels, right, the container level, which is like the class, or the test execution, so the at test method level. And at disabled is actually um, basically an implementation of this, right? And behind the scenes, there is a disabled condition um, written by yours truly that implements both of these 
these APIs. So it looks to see, is the class disabled? Then don't run any of the tests in it. Or if a particular test method is disabled, then don't run it. And just looks to see if at disabled is there. So that's the simplest case you could have for this. Um, but you can do other things like check an environment variable, like am I on the CI server? Or check your IP address or something like that. And the, the funniest one I've, I've heard um, in a blog, a guy said, well, we have this one really flaky test. Uh, it fails sometimes, and my boss won't let me leave when the CI server fails on Fridays. So if it's Friday afternoon, just don't run this test. Um, I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying you have the power to do that. <laughs> so, um, yes, and uh, another nice feature, uh, it wasn't really possible in uh, JUnit, at least it wasn't intentionally possible. Uh, there was a workaround to get it to ignore, add ignore. Um, but with conditions, you can uh, tell JUnit Jupyter to deactivate uh, these, the either a launcher property or a JVM system property that's named, JUnit conditions deactivate, and then a pattern that is similar to a regular expression. Um, you can read the documentation for the exact detail, details on that. But for example, if you wanted to disable all of the um, conditions from JUnit itself, you could say org.junit.star. If you didn't want to use springs for some reason, if you wanted to see, you know, we had this one test that uh, was failing on the, on the, wasn't working on local dev machines. I want to see if it still works, or if it works now, maybe it got fixed. Then I could deactivate that and, and run run the test suite locally. So you could also disable something like org dot spring framework uh, dot star stuff like that. <clears throat> so interface default methods, right? So this is a new feature in in, in Java eight, right? Um, introduces or allows for the concept of what I like to call um, a test interface. Um, basically allowing you to have a multiple inheritance in, in your test classes. Maybe you're not interested in at all, but there are times when it can be useful. And this is um, what I also like to call testing traits, right, if you're familiar with traits from other programming languages. So you can use this um, with before each and after each. You can't use it with um, before all and after all because they have to be static and those can't be default methods. Um, you can use this with at test methods, at test factory methods, um, with your tags, extend with, etc. And the string tests, I'm going to just uh, show that very quickly, just so you have an idea of what that kind of looks like. Right. So we have the string test, and it just, it just implements. It doesn't actually have any test methods. There's no test methods in here, right? But if I run this, it's going to have some, some tests that were executed, right? So return zero, value does not equal. And, and where are these things? They're actually in interfaces. So we look at string tests. Um, it has a comparable contract that implements and an equals contract. So then you can kind of pick and choose um, different testing traits that you've written across your code base. This should be applicable to, to multiple things, but maybe not applicable to all, all things. And then you can just uh, implement the, the tests right as default methods. And then maybe have a, um, a non-default uh, method, right? So you have an abstract method uh, that the classes have to actually implement. So if I wanted to see the implementation string test does actually implement that and return, return baz. So that's kind of how that can be used. Next up is this notion of um, nested test classes. Again, there were some custom runners for JNF4 to do that. Now it's built into JNF Jupyter. Um, this basically enables um, what we call logical hierarchical grouping um, of your test classes. So not just having them in different packages, but having them in the same uh, physical uh, Java source code source file, right? And in addition, they have shared initialization and state from outer classes, like so going from outside in. The way you do that, you just declare at nested on non-static nested classes, aka inner classes. And you can even combine this uh, nested support with the, um, the test interface support with these traits um, for some even more complex use cases where you want to, to kind of reuse, uh, well, trait features and, and state. So you see the testing a stack example in the user guide. I will, again, show this one just very quickly. Not going to write it all for you, um, but we see this is more the the BDD style. That's why people kind of like it. So using um you know real language here, a stack, um, and then we have is instantiated with new stack, right? But we have some some nested functionality. So we have this uh, when new, then then do this stuff, and then uh, within there we have additional uh, we can have additional nested. So after pushing etc. And so this nice combination of at nested and at display name. If we execute this, you see it looks quite nice actually. So here we see a stack is instantiated with new stack. And when it's new, uh, it's empty. After pushing an element, uh, it is no longer empty. So you can have this kind of BDD style with Jane and Jupyter. All right. 
dynamic tests. So um, conventional tests are what we call static, right? They're, they're known at compile time, right? You write in the code, maybe using something like a parameterized runner, um, but still you could look at it and say, okay, I know it's going to produce these 10 tests, right? Something like that. Um, and you do that with at test methods. But a dynamic test is registered at runtime, literally, dynamically, um, as a lambda expression and a stream collection, et cetera. And that's by um, in or done in a method annotated with at test factory. So don't put at test on there, but put at test factory on there. And this is somewhat analogous to parameterized tests, but with a parameterized test, the thing doing the parameterization is outside of your code. It's some extension. Maybe you configure it with annotations, but it's out of your control. And with the uh, dynamic tests, you're controlling what you want to be uh, generated as a test. So this, I will also show an example. Might make it a bit easier to understand. So let's do that in the actually let's say we want to have a return a stream of dynamic tests and we want this to be a test factory and this has to return something right so we could do return stream of something right and we could say dynamic test it's a static method and i could just say well um foo not very excited i know you're all wondering why can't you come up with something more exciting than foo? So we can say, did I, it all looks good, yep. Now if I run this, we see DevOps tests, and then second test, this is our, our factory method, right? And now we have, this is now a container, something different. So underneath that we see this, this foo this foo method. And what if we wanted to uh, add a couple more in there, right? We could say, and then have one that fails and not maybe not call it foo, but bar, I know, very exciting. So now we see second test and we see foo passed and, and bar failed. And if you click on bar, it's just gonna jump back to the method. But if you click on the exception, the error, then it actually goes straight to your, to your lambda expression. So that's, that's quite nice. So you can do this. Um, I recommend you look at the, uh, the user guide for more details on this. So you can return a stream, you can return a collection, an array, something like, um, not an array, sorry, a list, something like that. And you can also use an iterator to make completely um, non-deterministic uh, test generation in your code. So what's missing? <clears throat> Uh, Lifecycle callbacks for dynamic tests don't yet work, so uh, your at test methods get them, but these little lambda expressions, they don't get all the lifecycle callbacks, and we're going to look to fix that. Um, truly parameterized tests in the sense of the um, parameterized runner in, in JNet4 or JNet params, if you've heard of that, so um, an external way to have um, methods that are invoked parameterized. Scenario tests, um, this is something where the, uh, the state is maintained across your test. So JNet has um, traditionally, conventionally, always instantiated your test class anew. So there was no way to have any interactions between your tests. But sometimes you want to save state. And uh, other frameworks like um, TestNG support that. So we're looking to, to add that in JNet Jupyter as well. Also stuff for like um, running in a different thread or parallel execution. Um, those aren't there yet, but we hope to, to get that in before GA. And anything else, if you uh, give it a try and let us know, please create an, an issue so that we know there's a, a demand for a certain feature. So that's it for the uh, JNet5 stuff. And I'm going to have to speed up. I've talked too much. Um, Spring 5 and, and JNet5. So the support for JNet Jupyter um, came with Spring Framework 5.0 M1 um, several months ago. And that supports all the core um, testing features in Spring's test context framework, all the integration testing support, in addition to constructor and method injection via at autowired, at qualifier, and at value on, on your parameters. Um, and also, um, very cool, conditional test execution via spell expressions. Plus, you can have your application context um, injected, and you can configure that with nice uh, simple annotations. This also works with Spring Framework 4.3. Um, actually, I started writing it on 4.3. If you want to check that out, there's not anything you can um, you can download from, from Maven, but you can check out the code and build it yourself. Um, that's on, on GitHub here, Spring Test JNet5 in my account. So how can we configure this? There's a Spring extension, so right? Spring uh, previously had the Spring Runner or the Spring JNet4 class runner. Now we have the Spring extension. Just say at extend with Spring extension.class, and you get the Spring integration support. If you want to... Um, Simplify matters. This is a composed annotation at Spring JNet config that combines the at context configuration 
with the Spring extension. And similarly for the web support, um, combining what we had before plus um, your web app configuration, so you get a web application context loaded with Spring 5 and Jane and Jupyter all at the same time. Pretty straightforward stuff. And uh, the last part here, this at enabled if and at disabled if, so right, at disabled is core J unit Jupyter, um, but with disabled if, uh, we have support for spell expressions um, within our uh, conditional execution. So apparently I don't have time for the demo on that. I'll step through. Um, you can check out uh, the source code for Springer, ask me later. Basically I have an, an at enabled on Mac annotation that uses a spell expression to see is the current OS uh, doesn't contain the word Mac then um, only run this test here. You can do stuff similar with Windows, like don't run this on Windows or do run this on Windows. Um, pretty powerful stuff there. Um, Spring Boot 1.4, that also works nicely with um, JNet 5 and some custom config. So if you have stuff like uh, Spring Boot Test, some of the new annotations there, you can create your own uh, Compose annotation. Here we see Spring Events Web Test using this add extend with, that's the JNet Jupyter part, right? Telling it to use a Spring extension. And then we have the add Spring Boot Test, so that's the Spring Boot part. Um, auto config, that's also from Spring Boot, and the at transactional is just a standard one from, from Spring, right? So we see um, annotations coming in from different frameworks here, combine them all into one, and then we can just uh, reuse that across our code base um, like this. So we have an events controller test. Uh, this is in my Spring Events um, uh, demo app in my account on, on GitHub if you want to check it out. It's actually running, actually works, right? Spring Boot 1.4, JN and Jupyter, um, Spring 5 milestones. So then we have um, injecting the, the mock MVC instance that's auto-configured by Spring Boot, and so we see then just using that within the method. So in closing, um, resources, jnet.org slash jnet5. We have um, a nice user guide um, growing with each release. Um, it's actually very useful. I recommend uh, you read through that. Javadoc is also there online as well. And uh, of course, on, on Git, uh, GitHub, um, that's the source code repository, but we also have another uh, sister repository, the JNet5 samples, with a few smaller configuration samples for um, well, this Makito extension and the Gradle usage and, and Maven usage. And if you have questions, just uh, use the JNet5 tag on Stack Overflow. Spring, hopefully you know where to find all that stuff. If you don't, spring.io, and you'll find it from there. So time's up. That's the evening. Um, I think we don't have time for questions. You can ask me outside.